Hello everyone, and welcome uh, to the Early Christian and Byzantine chapter. Before we start this off, I would like to remind you all that I'm not trying to preach here. Uh, we're not breaking out in sermons. We're trying to present the points as they are covered in the book and present a perspective you know, which we don't normally think about, the beginning of Christianity. Not as the scripture says, but from an outside view. Because this is going to help us better understand the process, the context, and why Christianity uh, developed the visual language that it has, that it had in the beginning, and has developed into what we know today, or may know today. Looking at this map, we see the remnants of the Roman Empire before it is broken, well, rather, it's broken between the Western and the Eastern, or the Holy Roman Empire. Before this, though, we need to look at a little cult developed around the beginning of the millennium, based upon a man named Jesus Christ. Jesus of Nazareth, rather. And it really did begin begun it really did begin as a cult it was one man jesus of nazareth 12 disciples apostles whatever you want to call them and their message was very different than what was common for a roman rather than sacrificing your livelihood imagine you're a simple goat herd and you have a dozen goats to your name um, sacrificing one of those is incredibly expensive for your way of life Along comes this disciple who says, Brother, you can have salvation, you can have all of these things, and guess what? You don't have to sacrifice your goats. Moreover, you don't have to worship uh, Caesar, the emperor, as a god or someone who is higher than you, for he is just as, he is your equal. Okay, so from the mind of this simple goat herd, that's rather profound and hopeful hopeful words but the goat herd is kind of skeptical and so they say what do i have to do what's the catch and this holy person says there is no catch except for you give your your heart over to christ and this and that and you can have eternal life when you die you can go to the realm of heaven not just reserved for caesar or for the rich but for Popper and Prince alike. Well, sign me up. What you need to understand is that Christianity was originally worshipped as a cult. You know, while it was growing as a cult, it was worshipped in secret. It was illegal. Because think about it. If there is a state religion... Any other religion would be com competition, and you want to stamp out the competition, right? So, early on, there was a message of the fish, based upon a scripture in which Christ tells his disciples to be fishers of men, as a fisherman would cast his net to gather fish, the disciples would go forth preaching this word, preaching this word of salvation, and be fishers gathering men to the faith. With that idea, they would adopt the symbol of the ichthys, the fish, as one of their symbols, and thus this faith along with the image of Christ, the Cairo, the simple two letters of Christ, those two letters and this fish would serve as the foundation of the visual language of Christianity. And now we're off to the races. So, where were they worshipping? Christianity was worshipped in secret, underground, in the catacombs which essentially is a series of underground tombs, and underground graveyards, an underground city of the dead. Not necessarily a necropolis as we think of it in the Etruscan fashion, but quite literally this vast complex system of catacombs and, and tombs. So what is there in those tombs? What is there, quite simply, are the sarcophagi of pagan Romans. Those Romans with their clear pagan imagery, would fight with the imagery of the Christian language. 
So what do they do? They begin to adopt the pagan stories into a Christian story. The image of the Good Shepherd who carries a sheep. This, of course, is based upon Mercury, the messenger of the gods, or in another case, Hermes, the messenger of the gods. Jonah and the whale, various other messages from the Bible, stories from the Bible, were in fact adaptations of pagan stories. Christmas, uh, you know, you could look up all the ties of Christmas and Easter and, you know, why we have bunnies at Easter and why we have Christmas trees on East Christmas rather than, you know, celebrating a manger. Um, there are roots and connections there. Christ himself his image is based upon images of Zeus. Over the next few chapters, we're going to see Christ in two fashions. One, in which he is a bearded man, and later in some case, well, actually three. There's the young bearded man, there's the old bearded man, and this bearded fashion is based upon the idea of Zeus father of the gods, or in the Roman fashion, Neptune. When Christ is an adult and clean-shaven, he is based upon Apollo, an Apollonian view. One of his great disciples, John the Baptist, will be shown in that same fashion, in that Zeus-like form, and then clean-shaven, he becomes John the Apostle, or John the Evangelist, and is shown in an Apollonian view. So now we have this idea of the beginning of the cult of Christ. Well, later on, one great ruler named Constantine, one one of the greatest rulers, would have a vision in which God Almighty comes to him in his dreams and says, in this sign you will conquer if, if you put the Cairo upon your shields. Mm. Profound words. What's the risk? What's the harm? So, he tells his soldiers, put the Cairo on your shields and you shall win. For the soldiers, wow, our leader wants us to do this. God Almighty says, well, I don't know who God is, but let's do it. They do it, they win. What would that do to put a single image, the same image, on all your shields? Well, it would increase morale, some divine powers on our side, if this is the symbol of their power. It would increase unit cohesion, if we want to use a fancy uh, vocabulary word from another jargon. Um, you might have heard that before, uh, unit cohesion, you know, the, the unity of that group. It would certainly help. This here is an image, a larger-than-life image of Constantine. Um, following more the image of Alexander with his intense gaze, the tussled hair, the strong facial features. They would win, and with this victory, uh, Constantine would adapt, or would write the Edict of Milan, in which Christianity is now legal. Okay, so we don't have to worship in the catacombs. We take our imagery, we take the fish, we take these stories and these images, and we move them to the surface. But where are we going to worship? Here's the next thing. Again, based in a pagan root, or a, a, based in a pagan building, the basilica, going back to Greek, the basilikos, would be the foundation for the modern church or the modern basilica, which we think of as a church now. And there's a new addition here, which we will get to in a little bit. You still have the nave, or the naus, if we want to use the Greek term. We still have aisles. And now, instead of two apses, we have one apse. Now, if you're not familiar with the story of Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, in 33 AD, he would be crucified. Crucified means his body would be nailed to a plus sign, a cross made of wood, and the nails and the feet. And part of his story is that after being crucified, three days later, he would come back to life. Okay, so what they did, and this is incredibly clever, think about what I've said before, how architecture is psychological warfare. It, it, it can influence a person's uh, frame of mind or the context. They designed the church based on the basilica, which is based upon the basilicos. They designed a church based on that and call it a cruciform church. This church has one apse serving as the head, and the body is there in 
the church itself. So what does that mean? That the church itself serves as a metaphor. Salvation is offered through Christ. There is no way but through Christ. Christ is the way into heaven, into eternal salvation. What an incredibly simple, beautiful uh, metaphor now in this building, which is functional, which is beautiful. We'll see here in just a moment. It has all the same features. So for a modern Roman or a modern person, uh, civis, for, for a modern Roman citizen or a citizen of the empire, they see the Basilicos, or the Basilica in this case, and think, okay, I know this. Uh, we have the front area, the front porch, the atrium. Oh, okay. And wow, it's decorated differently, a little. Let's look at the inside. Whoa. You walk in the front door, and this is what you see. Let's remember for a moment what was the basil what was one of the purposes of the basilica. One of the purposes, one of the uses, was as a courthouse, a place of judgment. So, when you look at this space, I will always ask the class, how would it make you feel if you were standing here? And... 8.5, 9 times out of 10, I always hear the word small. Fear God and give glory to Him. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. The penitent man is humble before the eyes of God. So you have these magnificent columns, larger than life. You have this richly colored interior floor. This shows the, the richness, the means. We saw this in the Roman Empire to show off the majesty of the empire. Now, those same techniques, those same materials are showing off the majesty of the church. And in place of a judge, we have a single face, surrounded in gold, at the end, looking down at us. And below is the judgment of Christ, who sits upon his pedestal, his throne, looking down, the throne of heaven, as it were. On the side, we have those clerestory windows. Uh, if you, you might remember clerestory from test two, uh, or actually, yeah, from the Egyptian chapter. That always seemed to trip people up. We have the columns. We have Corinthian columns, by the way. And up here we have something I forgot to talk about in the Roman lecture, and that is the coffered ceiling. The coffered ceiling means bits of it have been carved out to make it lighter. Since this is a flat roof, there is a lot, I mean a great amount of weight being exerted on this center mass. If it was an arch, it wouldn't be such a big deal. But to ease on the weight of the structure itself, they carve out or they construct it to where these large sections are missing, thus lightening the load of the roof. Now this is St. Paul's. The original, the first basilica, the first church, the first Christian church was St. Peter's, and thus St. Peter, our first pope. So you enter this, you're made to feel small before the almighty power, majesty, and beauty of the church that is God. You're reminded of the salvation of God through this. And this next part, this circular part with eight sides, is what we're going to get to next, because there are, in fact, two types of churches. There is the cruciform church, and then the next type of church is the round church, known as the centrally planned church. Now, the centrally planned church can be used for churches, for mausolea, or for baptistries. And where we normally have an aisle, we have an open space around the nave. The nave is still the main center area, and the aisle is around. But in the case of the centrally planned church, it's called an ambulatory. To ambulate means to walk. Now, in the case of baptistries, we have those same features baptism, in which a person is immersed in water as a public acknowledgement of their faith and their conversion to the Christian faith. Um, there are other uses and contexts, but for now, that's, that's really all you need to know. Uh, what I want to get to next is really interesting. The number eight. 
what does the number eight have to do with the church? Typically, if you ask someone uh, that is even semi-religious, you might think of the numbers five for man, six for the devil, and seven for Christ. Or, well, for God. Um, but the number eight doesn't pop up that often, except for a couple of places. Once in the Old Testament and once in the New Testament. And dozens upon dozens of uh, dead and living scholars have looked through this, and I'm not pulling this out of my rear end. This is the idea as to why the number eight is important to the faith of Christianity. Ideal one. If you, in the story of the Old Testament, after God created the world, he, uh, a man has original sin and thus is damned and God looks on his creations and he's disappointed so he decides to start over man 2.0 to do this though he needs to save some people so he calls upon a man named Noah some of you have probably heard of Noah uh, but it's not just him but he Noah then goes asks goes to ask his sons Ham and Shem and Jophath, or I can't remember. I can never remember the, ne the the last one's name. So you have these four men, and of course their wives. And there's the story of taking two of each type of animal on this gigantic ark to survive the flood. God floods the world, and thus we have a new start. So those eight people, the number eight refers to the eight people that were the new, the new chance of man by God in the Old Testament. Now that's one idea as to why the number eight is so profoundly important and thus the basis of the centrally planned church. The second reason is based upon Christ and God's creation myth. So according to the creation myth, God created the world in seven days. On the seventh day he rested. And so, well, why isn't the baptistry seven sided? Well, because of original sin, the damnation of man, and then God coming down as Christ, offering man a new life, salvation, and thus an eighth day of heaven on earth. So Christ coming down and the salvation through Christ offers man an eighth day, an additional day in life uh, past original sin. So you have one idea based on Noah, you have one idea based on God and Christ and the eighth day being a new new chance. And this is the idea behind the centrally planned church is eight 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 side design. Now one of the earliest beautiful examples of that in Europe is San Vitale. This is the personal church of Justinian, Justinian who came after Constantine. It is plain on the outside, but that's rather clever for the Christian faith, and we'll get to that in just a moment. On the inside, it's rather rich looking, and it has a new architectural feature we need to be aware of, and that is the buttress. Now, the buttress is not a mistress with a really nice butt. Rather, okay, um, it is a support. It butts up against a wall. Now, think about it. This is not the Colosseum. These walls, these massive stone walls, using load-bearing construction, it's bigger on the bottom, it gets smaller up towards that third floor, they're straight up and down. And when you have that third floor and the wall that's kind of diagonal pushing down, it's pushing outward, laterally. That weight here would normally push that wall out, but by using a massive weight to push up against it, it helps to hold this wall up, which then supports this third floor. A buttress butting up against the building. Later on in the Gothic chapter, in the Gothic period, we'll have the flying buttresses, the flyers, and so forth. But for now, we're simply looking at San Vitale with its plain, plain brick exterior. But that's a really clever metaphor for Christianity, because it doesn't matter if you're rich, anyone can have salvation through Christ. So even the most poor, decrepit beggar can have a rich spiritual inside. And that, that alone is one of the most beautiful concepts which would lure or attract more to the faith. So on the outside, plain, but on the inside, rich, covered in gold. 
So I, I want you to put your imagination caps on really quick. Just imagine how this might look by firelight, by the hanging, swinging, gentle light of the, of the candles, of the lamps. As the clouds move over the church and the sky, it would create a shimmering changing of the lights of those windows. Moreover, that changing light would be caught on all those thousands of tesserae covered in gold. And there we have Christ Almighty. Not the Pantocrator that we norm normally think of, but Christ on this perfect globe, rather than a throne, a circle symbolizing the world, symbolizing perfection. In the Christian visual language, the number one is important as well, for the one refers to a circle, a sun, a uh, perfect, never-ending shape. Christ sits there and holds out his right hand. His right hand is offered in blessing and absolution. We sometimes might see him raising his hand with two fingers. I think if we go back to the beginning of the chapter, you'll see that. His left hand is more used in condemnation or to hold that book of judgment or to hold the codex, which is the word, the word of God. Now, to be a person's right-hand man means you can depend upon them. They are your second, they're your, the... The, the executive officer, the commander Riker to your Captain Picard. In this case, on the right hand of God is Justinian himself. There he is, the king. Now, why would the king, who before tried to suppress religion, why would he be presenting himself now as faithful? Well, because Constantine did it? Perhaps we need to think about why would a king want to adopt faith? Perhaps they did have a personal transformation, or perhaps a crafty ruler saw the influence of this new, powerful, influential faith. Well, if I can't rule my people as a god king, then I will present myself as one of them, a faithful Christian, and a person to admire because of my faith, my generosity, my holiness a holy king, a faithful king. Well, a member of the empire could certainly get behind that kind of king because surely he's one of us. He is nice. And here he is seen as benevolent and generous, and he calls upon the might and power of Constantine by reminding us of that, of that vision of the Cairo and the shields. Justinian never fought a great battle and through some vision. That was Constantine. So, why do that? Well, if you think about it, think about all the presidential candidates who, who drop names. Like Kennedy, I blah blah blah. Like Ronald Reagan, I blah blah blah. They, they drop those names and hints, so you may feel that they are something like those great rulers that walked before them. Last thing about Justine, I want the last thing here I want you to see about this is his feet. Notice how close his feet are to the bottom. And then compare that when we look across the room at his wife, Theodora. Theodora is higher up, but here she is presented as holy, as faithful. She has attendants and she has offerings. And notice that one of her attendants seems to be pulling back a curtain to a fountain. A fountain of life, a fountain of pure water, what have you. But the interesting thing about that fountain is the fact that it is shown in a double perspective. On the one hand, we have the Corinthian column shown flat. Above that, though, we have a, co we have a fountain and a column of water being shown in perspective. So we have to remember that we're not looking at this from eye level. We're looking up. So they're creating the illusion of understanding that we are looking at this holy water, this holy fountain of life, but there's also this beautiful little uh, Corinthian column. The features of San Vitale are very similar to any other centrally planned church. You have a nave, you have a narthex, the narthex being the, you know, the porch, the front porch entrance of the church, the aisle and the apse, the apse being the focus where the priest or the choir might might meet and talk. 
And San Vitale was the place for some time until we get to Constantinople. Constantinople, of course, being the home of the Holy Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. It is there that we find the greatest, perhaps the greatest of all of the Central Lupin churches, Hagia Sophia. Now, you might have heard this pronounced as Hagia Sophia, Hagia Sophia, Hagia Sophia. Uh, doesn't matter to me how you pronounce it, as long as we understand what it is we're looking at and talking about here. This building was not designed by architects, rather by mathematicians, who, like Imhotep, said, Yo, dog, I heard you like this, so let me see what I could do with that. In this case, it's not a mastaba that he is pimping out. Rather, he's taking domes. So, like, Yo, dog, I heard you like domes, and big stuff, so I'm going to take a half dome, I'm going to use that as a buttress for an even bigger dome, and then put a third dome up on top. You feel me? So we got dome, dome, central dome on top. Now, if that's the case, where these domes are supporting each other, the walls themselves really don't, don't even need to be there, because this dome supports that, and these corners but where the domes meet, and this is a four-sided, centrally planned there are eight sides to it, but we see the bulk of it. It's so bulky that we really focus on just the four directions of east, west, north, and south. These different sections come together, and that's the real support. Walls themselves here are irrelevant, which is why the walls have been now decorated with dozens and dozens of windows thus turning the wall into what may be known as a lunette wall or a screen wall. We can see that in more detail here. Uh, since the walls are not so important as load-bearing uh, walls, they are more decorative, and the domes become even more complex. For pendentives, the peripheral domes, and understanding how they work together is vital. But Mr. Fernandez, if this is a church, why is there Arabic on the wall? Well, there's a reason for that, general student. See, the church did not originally have those four towers. Originally, this was a Christian church. Uh, uh, as I make this video, I just lost it off the tip of my tongue. I know at 3 o'clock in the morning tonight, I'll just figure it out. But uh, with the growth of one of the caliphates and the uh, Islamic one of the Islamic empires, this was converted from a church into a mosque. And one of the main features of a mosque are the four minarets. The minarets being towers in which the imam would call the faith, or the, the imam or the muezzin would call the faithful to prayer. So that is what these are. Hagia Sophia has gone through three transformations. First as a church, later as a mosque, and in its current state, it serves as a library slash museum. But with the rising influence and conflicts of ISIS, there is, and through some political parties, there is a, a desire to turn it back into a mosque. Uh, after it was first converted into a mosque, many of the images of Christ and many of the holy images that were first decorated there were destroyed because images of man is haram or forbidden in the Islamic faith. The interior itself, though, has all the same features that we would see with a centrally planned church, the nave or the naus. We have the, the, the apse or the sanctuary. We have the aisles, the half domes, and of course the narthex made into two parts here, the inner and the outer, the atriums where people would meet. So I ask you again to use your imagination and imagine, with all those windows, as the clouds move across the sky, and massive, massive oil lamps hang and swing in the wind, how would all that gold glitter and look inside? If a person is to made f to feel small but for the almighty glory and power of God, have they achieved their goal in designing it here? I'm inclined to say, yeah. <laughs> you can see the people and how small they are before this space. And all this openness that's, doesn't serve a function other than to impress and inspire. Inspire humility and inspire faith. So what is the outer hallway called? 
it is not an aisle. It is called an ambulatory or an aisle. I'll take either as long as you understand these features. Uh, before I get back to Christ, I'd like to show you these are the main features of Hagia Sophia as a mosque. It has all of the same features except the, added, except the addition of the minarets themselves. Here we can see the baptistry. And while it doesn't necessarily have the eight sides to the structure itself, it, it is there. It is a rather bulky, bulky design, which can, makes it hard to see the sides of the church itself. Now, with that said, let's look at one of the beautiful lasting pieces that has survived uh, from the original design, from the original church itself. Christ Pantocrator, Christ himself, shown in all of his golden glory. Now, there's something really clever and beautiful here. We have, we have Christ in full color. You can see the cheeks. You can see all those subtle subtleties to his face. But when we look here, we see rich, beautiful gold. We could spend a little time talking about how much gold the church has, but right now I want you to be aware of the gold around his head in that halo. Do me a favor, if you're watching this, take your right hand and your left hand and hold them flat up and down in front of you, like straight up and down. Okay, now turn your right hand just a little diagonally and turn your left hand a little in a different angle. Okay, not the same as your right. So imagine those are pieces of gold up against a wall. That's what they did with each of these little tesserae, specifically in this halo. Normally we think of those little tiles being flat on the wall, and for the most part, they are. But for the halo, they turned those tesserae, they tilted them at different angles. Why would they do that? To impress. To make sure you felt humble before the almighty power of Christ. See, what happens is, with those tesserae turned, at different angles, it's going to catch the light of the fire, catch the light of the sun differently. And as that fire dances and moves, what does that do? It makes his halo glow. It makes his halo glow. So if you are that simple shepherd, that simple goat herd that has come in from the mud, from the mire, from the harshness of life, and you see this incredible building. It is the largest thing you will ever see in your entire life, and you see this image of Christ. Would you not feel a little humbled, a little in, amazed and inspired by this message? I'm inclined to bet you are. Notice how he has his hand raised, the two fingers up, the sign of uh, absolution, or the sign of benediction. Um, still used today in the church by some of the priests in uh, certain sects or uh, denominations. What we have on the bottom right corner is called the Desus. This is not the Trinity. We have an image of Christ following that Zeus-like face with a heavy beard. And on the right, we have a heavily bearded man who is John the Baptist. John the Baptist being Christ's right-hand man. But instead of being on the right, we have Christ's mother, Mary. Mary, the virgin that would give birth to Christ. When Christ, Mary, and John the Baptist are shown together, or Christ, Mary, and John the Evangelist are shown together, John the Evangelist being the clean-shaven one, they were referred to as the Desus. And so that is something worth remembering and understanding. It is the image of the Desus that will pop up in our last thing to discuss, and that is the book, the Codex. For thousands of years, man has been writing on clay, on stone, and on papyrus. And papyrus is fun, except you have to roll it up, and you have to roll that 30 feet thing out and try to find what it is you're looking for. But someone finally took paper, took parchment, folded it, sewn it together, and now we have a codex. And what were the first codices? Can you guess? They were Bibles. The first codices, the first books, were Bibles. And so, what does this mean for art? What does this mean for information? Information is now even more agile, even more mobile, and even more hostile. Well, not necessarily hostile, but hopefully you catch my meaning. 
So now the message of Christianity, the simple message of you no longer have to sacrifice your animals, you don't have to pay homage to the emperor like you did before, do these things, and through Christ you may have eternal salvation. The, the word can spread even farther. And so here comes a disciple walking through a small village that doesn't even have a permanent building. They sit down with one of these books with beautiful decorations, covered in gold and gilded with beautiful, beautiful illustrations, and they tell their stories, and people are looking. What were they thinking? Wow. Because there's something about pictures, right? There really is something about having pictures more than just words. Words are okay if you like to read, but, you know, some people like comic books. Some people like to have pictures with their words because it's easier to understand. But the church has a problem with that because... Images have power. And I'm pretty confident all of you at some point have really enjoyed pictures. I mean, we could discuss the stereotype that, you know, teenage boys and college age men and middle aged men collect pornographic images, or we could flip that around and talk about women that collect things on Pinterest or Tumblr or something else. They collect images. I mean, we could be. We could, you know, talk about cliches of women saving wedding gowns and their perfect pictures or perfect outfits, or men saving pictures of trucks, or children that have to have SpongeBob this and SpongeBob that, or eight year olds with Bieber fever. They absolutely worship those images, don't they? Well, the church saw the power of images and they said it was bad because they're no longer worshiping the word they're worshiping the image and that is idolatry that is wrong and so for a time we would have what is known as the iconoclastic controversy in which the leaders of the christian church started to have doubts about whether or not we should have images of christ we definitely do not want to have sculptures because sculptures lead to idolatry. I mean, think about the golden calf. Well, the iconoclasts and the iconophiles, they talked, they conflicted, they argued, and eventually the iconophiles triumphed. Mosaics and paintings are okay. Sculptures, no. Because, you know, remember that story of the golden calf? We don't want to have a bunch of idols. Let's look at the images and let the images, the beauty of those images, with their gold and their multiple colors, let those images be the figurehead, the icons for the faith. And that's what we're looking at here. Icons. A painting on a piece of wood, which is raised up or set on a table as a focus of faith, as a priest gives a sermon or a choir sings a song. You focus on that image, and now we get iconography, and we can understand now a little more the power of images. We've gone very quickly through this chapter, and we've seen how Christianity started with two letters and a simple fish. But as the faith grew, they established more visual concepts, more words in their vocabulary, from the cross, from the sign of absolution or benediction, to the desis. In this case here, John the Baptist is shown as the boy, that is John the Evangelist, and Christ with his Zeus-like face is in the center, with Mary now on the right. Now who is this guy? This old man holding some keys which look like coffin spikes or railroad spikes. Well, in the Christian faith, the old man holding what actually are keys is Peter, the first pope. Peter who holds the gates to the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And Christ is not always shown as a Zeus or an Apollonian figure. He is sometimes shown as a baby in which the Mother Mary sits in the center on a throne, and Christ as a baby sits with his halo and the angels flanking around. Over the next few centuries, images of Christ will become more complex, will vary, as will images of the apostles, the disciples, or the evangelists in their different stages. There are several terms to be aware of here. 
several terms that we'll, we will continue to use, like altar, baptistries, uh, gallery, transepts. You'll definitely need to know that. The screen wall, tessera, tesserae, minarets. When we talk about Islam, we'll have to know that. Mausolea. Um, if you have any questions, though, please don't hesitate to ask. And uh, thank you for your time. If, again, if you have any questions, you can step by the office. You can take the online quizzes. And, of course, you can always copy my notes. Thanks a lot for your time.